Hi. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I wish to thank my NDP colleagues for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I will be splitting my time with the member for Edmonton Strathcona. One third of working Canadians don't have employer funded drug coverage. One in five households reported a family member who, in the past year, had not taken a prescribed medicine due to its cost. Par année, près de 3 millions de Canadiens et Canadiens ont affirmé ne pas être en mesure de débourser les frais pour l'un de plusieurs de leurs médicaments prescrits. In the 2019 election, I heard these statistics echoed at doors and across party lines. I am excited by the idea of National Pharmacare and the support I know has, that we have from members in this House to improve the lives of Canadians. I am also excited by how much work has already been done to understand what our National Pharmacare plan needs to look like. Last June, the well-known published final report of the Advisory Council on Implementation of National Pharmacare, also known as the Hoskins Report, um, advised that they received questionnaires from more than 15,000 people and organizations, received 14,000 petitions or letters, reviewed more than 150 written submissions, investigated global best practices, hosted town halls and roundtables. They uncovered significant gaps in drug coverage. Of the nearly 3 million Canadians who said they were not able to afford their prescriptions, 38% had access to private insurance coverage. 21% had public coverage. But with copays and exemptions, they still did not have the resources to afford their medications. Almost 1 million Canadians were forced to cut back on food or home heating in order to pay for their medication. And près de 1 million de Canadiens et Canadiennes ont dû emprunter des sommes d'argent afin de payer les frais de leurs médicaments prescrits. This highlights the crushing poverty weighing on Canadians. It has many causes, but with PharmaCare, we can take one worry away. We can alleviate some of the stress and uncertainty in their lives. In the Hoskins report, the Advisory Council laid out several recommendations to address these gaps, and I will reiterate them here. Its first and foremost recommendation was the federal government's work with the, that work with the provincial and territorial governments to establish a universal, single-payer public system of prescription drug coverage in Canada. A two-tiered system would create further inequity, leaving low-income and unemployed Canadians at risk. The administration of such a program would be cost-ineffective. A privately administered system would create profit incentives where public interest must be the first priority. The Council also recommended that national pharmacare benefits be portable across provinces and territories. This reinforces the need for federal leadership to come alongside provincial health departments to ensure that the system is truly national in scope. Une autre recommandation voulait que tous les résidents canadiens et les résidents canadiens puissent tirer profit d'un programme national d'assurance médicaments afin d'assurer que tout et toutes puissent avoir accès aux médicaments dont elles et ils ont besoin afin de maintenir une bonne santé physique et mentale. They also recommended a national formulary be developed to list which prescription drugs and related products should be covered to ensure all Canadians have access equally to the medicines they need to maintain or improve their health no matter where they are living in Canada. Clearly, this is a big job. We are going to need leadership from our Prime Minister and his Cabinet, and we are going to need significant financial investment from the federal government to make this happen. It is remarkable that Canada is the only developed country that has a universal health care program that does not include universal coverage for prescription medication, especially when we know there are real costs associated with people who need to skip doses or avoid filling prescriptions because they cannot afford to buy them. These decisions put strain on our health care system. Les gens ne sont pas en mesure de vivre pleinement en santé pendant la durée de leur vie, ce qui entraîne des complications et des maladies chroniques plus tard dans leur vie. Individuals end up in urgent health care situations, needing to return to hospital emergency rooms, taking up hospital beds because they couldn't afford to properly manage their conditions and illnesses at home. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has already indicated that this will save federal, provincial and territorial governments billions of dollars. And that doesn't even consider the quality of life for Canadians who require prescription medicines. A recent study by St. Michael's Hospital, MAP Centre for Custom Health Solutions, found that providing free medicine resulted in a 44% increase in people taking their essential medications and led to a 160% increase in the likelihood of participants being able to make ends meet. Ensuring people have access to the medications they need throughout their life will have real positive impacts, such as poverty reduction as people become able to direct their money towards food, rent, home heating or childcare. 
Also, when a chronic condition is well managed with medications, individuals can better access the workforce and participate in communities. Les personnes atteintes d'une maladie rare ne doivent pas déclarer faillir en raison de leur diagnostic. Those living on fixed incomes, like seniors, are not stuck with increasing pharmaceutical costs. And for people in immediate mental health crisis, the extra financial anxiety of a new medication does not have to weigh on them. I am struck as well by the consensus that exists around this issue. La majorité des membres en cette chambre se sont engagés auprès du parti lors de la dernière élection qui ont fait de ce enjeu en priorité. Polls show that 90% of Canadians support equal access to prescription drugs, regardless of income. I was hopeful when I saw National Pharmacare referenced in the mandate letters of four ministers that we would actually see this happen in the 43rd Parliament. But I am a little concerned that nothing seems to be moving on this front yet, and I'm so thankful for this motion by my NDP colleagues. Maybe we will be pleasantly surprised when the budget is tabled. But I fear that our government may be losing its courage perhaps because of the lobbying that is happening by pharmaceutical and insurance companies. I hope this government is being vigilant against letting entities with deep pockets and full-time Ottawa-based lobbyists buy influence on our policy development process. I have spent time with representatives from community organizations, healthcare professionals, and their unions that we need universal public pharmacare, groups like the Heart and Stroke Foundation, National Nurses Union, Diabetes Association of Canada, Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association, Canadian Health Coalition, Canadian Labour Congress, I could go on. These organizations represent average Canadians, workers in the health field, and those who are living with or caring for people with chronic or acute disease. These are the people we work for. The Canadian Medical Association shared the stories of doctors fighting for national pharmacare. Dr. Nav Prasad had this to say, why did I spend all those years training to become a doctor if at the end of it, when I give someone a diagnosis, they don't fully benefit because they can't afford the treatment? The Advisory Council on the Implementation of National Pharmacare let, left us with their, the way forward. It will take time, significant federal investment, and close collaboration among all health system partners to turn Canada's patchwork of prescription drug insurance plans into a national public pharmacare program. But it is possible. Thanks to the work of this council, the path forward is clear. Les données sont incontestables. Canadians are on board. Parliamentarians in this House are mostly on board. We're here to represent the people, and this is what the people want. So, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, my final reflection is this. What are we waiting for? Thank you. Bravo. Questions et commentaires? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member uh, for Vancouver Kingsway. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'm really, really uh, pleased to hear the remarks of my honourable colleague from the Green Party and uh, on her uh, contributions to this important subject. And I was particularly happy and, and thought it was really helpful in this debate for her to name so many of the organizations and uh, who represent so many Canadians in various aspects of, of, of life across Canada who support the idea of public farm career. This isn't just something that political parties are pushing here. This is something that comes from our communities, from the grassroots. It's doctors, it's health professionals, it's nurses, it's, it's, uh, it's hospitals, it's patient groups, it's unions, it's employer groups, it's, uh, it's industry, it's health economists. Uh, and I'm just wondering if my honorable colleague can maybe elaborate on that. And, and, and what's her if she can tell the House what her sense of, of support there is in her community and in stakeholder groups across this country, does she believe that it has majority support of Canadians across our land? Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank my honourable colleague for that question. You know, I, I think back to the election process and, and knocking on countless doors, visiting every um, long-term care facility in my riding, um, senior care facilities, discussing these issues of health care and high costs. Um, I have high, high demographics of seniors in my, in my riding as well, and this was something that they acknowledged was what would help them. So they, they talked to me about some of the times they had to make that decision between um, heating or food and medication. So we've heard that line so many times, but it's because it needs to be repeated. That should not be happening in Canada. Um, nurses, doctors, we had so many meetings with these organizations um, over the past few months as well. So it's, it's something for me that was unanimous. Um, it seemed to be a no-brainer, and I really hope that we can make this happen for them. The commentaire, questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Calgary Shepherd. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. They, they found me here on the floor of the House. I'd like to thank the member for her contributions to this debate. I, I, I noticed that she's a member of Fredericton. She did mention there are some members who don't agree, so thank you for recognizing that fact. I'm pleased that she's here in this House and not her predecessor, who I disagreed with often in this place. Um, so despite having disagreements, obviously we can agree that no patients should be left behind. And my, the primary uh, argument I've been making is that rare disease patients will be left behind in the national pharmacare system. Uh, because in finding value for money and cost effectiveness, the way the Hoskins report talks about, it requires picking which medications you will cover in the current regulatory infrastructure and architecture that the federal government has will be simply enhanced. So would she agree with me that we should first fix the regulatory system we have before we try and impose an Ottawa-centric system on every single province across Canada? For Fredericton. And I thank my honourable colleague, and I'm happy to be here as well instead of my, my predecessor. Um, but, and I also want to thank you for your advocacy um, for, for rare diseases, and we also care deeply about that issue, and we know we need to work harder. And so, uh, you know, and to address the issue about maybe we should deal with the regulatory system as it is first, but I don't think we have time to wait. I think we can do these alongside of, of one another. Um, it certainly should be part of the considerations for National Pharmacare, but I, do, I don't think it has to mean we're leaving those patients behind. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Écoutez, on va encore m'accuser de poser toujours la même question, mais c'est parce qu'on n'obtient jamais de réponse dans cette Chambre. Alors, moi, je vais quand même poser la question. J'apprécie beaucoup euh, le discours de, ma, de ma, euh, mon honorable collègue et, et je sens, j'ai beaucoup d'empathie pour toutes les personnes qui vivent des drames humains avec les maladies rares. Ça, ça va bien. On, je vous suis, euh, toutes les gens qui ont fait des discours aujourd'hui. Par contre, je ne sais pas comment on, comment on va faire. L'Assemblée nationale, unanime, en juin dernier, a voté une motion qui, qui, qui dit que le Québec refuse d'adhérer à un régime canadien d'assurance médicaments. Tout le monde, pas juste les, 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 la CAQ au pouvoir, le Québec solidaire, PQ, tout le monde est unanime au Québec. On veut, ne on veut pas en parler, on ne veut même pas en parler. On a notre propre système, pas parfait, mais ça fonctionne assez bien. Nous, ce qu'on demande... Donnez-nous les sous. Si vous, vous faites, si vous voulez faire un système d'assurance médicaments national, pas de problème, on va vous suivre. Mais on demande, nous, des transferts en santé. Ça fait des années qu'on demande ça. Le, le système de santé au Québec est sous-financé. On demande des transferts de l'ordre de 5,2 Nous, si vous faites un système national, parfait, mais on veut des sous. Qu'est-ce que ma collègue pense de ça? Honorable député de Fredericton, rapidement. Uh, merci, Madame Speaker, et merci à mon collègue. Uh, you know, that is a challenge. It is, it's going to have to take all provinces on board for this to be cost effective. And so it's really important that we have these debates in the House, that it goes to committee, and we make sure that the, the interests of Quebec are, are looked after. Um, and I mean, to me, again, I look at all the statistics, I look at all the support, I look at all these organizations, and I, I have a hard time understanding why you wouldn't want that program. Uh, we've also advocated for increases in health transfers, um, but it just it seems like it would be the best thing for Quebec as well as Canada. So I would like to know more.